Our, um, I'm going to introduce our first uh, speaker. And um, who, um, our first speaker today is going to be Bridget Harvey. Uh, Bridget Harvey uses making to ask critical questions, generate new understanding and adding meaning through craft, investigating processes and concepts through making. She asks what we make, how we make it and why that matters. She embraces interdisciplinarity using found objects and materials like fired ceramics, wood, and textiles. Through her artifacts, she examines ideas like pace, repetition, and playfulness. Since 2013, she is focused on repair within multiple disciplines and as an independent practice. As um, in 2018-2019, she, um, she was an artist in residency in the Victorian Albert Museum. And she examined there the relationship of repair uh, uh, to conservation through artifacts. And uh, she made a publication and exhibition and her PhD uh, based pra uh, practice uh, based PhD was titled Repair Making Craft Narratives Activism. So um, welcome, uh, Harvey, it's a pleasure having you here and uh, over to you. Thanks. Hiya, I'm really sorry that I'm not <clears throat> there today. Um, we've been afflicted with various little illnesses here. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that um, you can hopefully see. Um, Marina, can you see that, that PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Brilliant. Great, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> thanks you, for that introduction, Marina. That was really uh, Bridget, great. Bridget, sorry, do you want to have yeah. your uh, do you want to have your own video on as well? No, no. Okay, you don't okay, need okay to I'll leave it. Okay, okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that introduction, Marina. Um, and like I say, I'm sorry I'm not there in person today. Um, so this morning, I'm going to just talk through um, my practice overall and also some ideas about kind of hope and risk and how they uh, relate to making. And so like Marina said, uh, my background's in kind of craft and making, and I'm interested in this idea of what we make and how we make it and why that matters. And the kind of underlying, I guess, concepts and processes of craft making. So what goes on behind the um literal acts of making that we do in the studio as well as making um objects i run workshops i speak and write about my work and other people's work and i teach um ma students i'm really interested in domestic objects in the everyday and how we relate to them and from that how they relate us to the wider world and to the sort of bigger picture of what goes on around us i've got really ongoing interest in sustainability um, and lo-fi or relatively inclusive ways of working, so working together or uh, accessible ways of working. So I personally do often work with specialist tools and materials, but um, I'm also really interested in social engagement and our collective responsibilities through my practice. Um, and I believe that as well as skilled material knowledge, our making can show political intent um, by acknowledging the complexities of craft across time and class and place and intention, we can really discuss what making actually means today. Um, so I'm going to start with my all time favourite definition of sustainability, which is that sustainability is the possibility that humans and other life will flourish on the earth forever. Um, so this, uh, this is one reason that my practice is really grounded by an understanding of hope. Um, and so I wanted to pause for a couple of minutes and just talk about hope in relation to material practice a little more deeply. Um, I feel like as creative practitioners, we're constantly engaging with risk. Um, so that must mean that we are hopeful of success and about the outcomes, um, both of our practical work and maybe our messages as well. But I am really interested in how that comes together in our practice. So, um, 
hope kind of begins in the margins, right? It's an expectation for something to happen and it's an intention to do something towards it, to paraphrase uh, Rebecca Solnit. Um, so it helps us write new stories for what we're trying to do. Um, discussions of hope deepen our understanding of, of humanness um, and activism and motivation. So hope unlocks our latencies and makes our subconscious goals manifest. Um, John Ehrenfeld, again, who, who, who did that uh, sustainability definition, he comments that the power of hope has really manifested throughout history as when societies have faced crises, they've lost the ability to run themselves, but right at the very bottom, they have found hope. And then the people dedicated themselves to solving their problems regarded, regardless sorry, of the rational data-driven reasons to give up. So they wrote entirely new stories to guide them. And that's what hope is all about. But um, Rebecca Solnit again, she emphasizes that hope is only a starting point and it's not a substitute for action, just a basis for it. Um, just, I mean, yeah. Um, both of them suggest that hope can help uh, mindset change and shifts in our way of thinking and doing. So sort of starting out on those edges, hope gives us something to aim for. Active hope, however, um, is a way of practicing and channeling that hope. So it's um, as something we do rather than have. Active hope relates to our intentions of actively choosing what we aim for or away from and using this as guidance. And it also sees gratitude as a vital act of reciprocity and uh, regeneration. So when hope kind of calls for action and action is impossible without hope, that act the idea of active hope kind of consciously engages and hope becomes our motivation and gives us possibilities. So Solnit again, she tells us that hope is a commitment to the future. Active hope asks you to see that anew, it refers to an interconnected sense of self within community and planet and a long time frame. And it looks at what contributions the distributed knowledge within those networks can make uh, towards the change that we need and asks us to kind of make use of that. Um, so if hope is <clears throat> the story of uncertainty, of coming to terms with the risk, which can be both demanding and frightening, but um, immeasurably, immeasurably more rewarding than despair, then maybe like risk and uncertainty is the point where hope as disposition meets hope in our material practices, right? So as a maker, I think you come to terms with uncertainty. Um, quite you have to kind of come to terms with uncertainty because that's part of what making is um the wood turner and theorist david pye he suggests that the quality of the result is continually at risk during the process of making and he calls that the workmanship of risk so like hoping and caring for the outcome um step by step um, through that making process. So for me, repair work is nearly always the workmanship of risk, right? It unfolds as we enter more deeply into the task, into the damage, um, into the conversation with the owners or whatever it is. Um, and we have to use the diversity of technique that, that Pi tells us is not available through the workmanship of certainty. So where he describes that workmanship of, workmanship of certainty as requiring a front loading of judgment and dexterity and care, making and repair making really requires these to be deployed throughout the process. And we might use tools and strategies to like limit risk, but the risk is still present throughout our creative practice. It's kind of made real by the human doing it, by us doing it. Um, Otto von Busch, who's a, a fashion theorist, he suggests that through repair, hope becomes fused into material and form, and that um, self-reliance and trust also emanates from that practice. So there's no really to say that the workmanship of risk has exclusive prerogative of quality, but more that it has an immensely various range of qualities, and, and that's really what we um, need. So for me, um, creative practice and the emotions of hope kind of meet in risk and then they kind of develop together. So yeah, any attempt at creative practice is always gonna be a risk. So it's gotta be accompanied by hope, otherwise we might just not bother doing it. But through repetition and practice, our skills grow and spread and through time, maybe many hopes join together and maybe the change becomes material, the conversations become material 
Um, and risk is reduced or moved by hope and by getting on with it, actually. Being comfortable with risk and, and for me, having hope is vital for resilience, for activism, for practice, and especially for repair work. So, repair. Um, repair and the kind of brokenness requiring it, which obviously repair requires in order to exist, is a huge and shifting and really fascinating terrain. It's seen in objects as ancient as lith lithium knives and as modern as smartphones. And it's now surging in this like post-abundance and environmentally unstable era as a critical choice and a politic, a form of material and emotional and social uh, resilience. It's been, um, as Marina mentioned, at the center of my practice for about eight and a half, maybe a bit longer years now. Um, roughly speaking, repair used to be routinely practiced, but this stopped as capitalism and industrialization grew and repair was kind of designed out. But now post abundance, we're indebted to the natural world um, and Earth is kind of reacting to our cumulative taking. So um, the climate crisis is showing us to be less capable and less adaptable, and less elastic, less skilled than we might be. But some of us are like drawing on those useful lessons from our past and starting to repair again. So the discourse of repair is resurging. People are repairing literally and also by rethinking um, objects and mindsets and habits. And that's what I uh, refer to as the third wave of repair. So object breakages can become familiar, like the handle uh, breaking off a cup. And when something breaks, even if it's done deliberately, it's brought to our attention. It requests an interaction. However routine the break may be, um, it leads to the decisional burden of repair. You've got to, if nothing else, just sweep up the glass you dropped on the floor, right? So, um, and some repair requires like really deep knowledge of materials and objects, but others require a little more than just some gaffer tape and a bit of uh, gumption, a bit of have a go. The philosopher and mechanic, uh, Matthew Crawford, he writes that uh, things need fixing and tending no less than creating and repair requires an openness to the obscurities of objects made by others. So as a repair maker, we've got to um, look and listen and notice things. The anthropologist Douglas Harper, he calls, uh, or he defines really rationalized repair as a automatic uh, routine replacement of defective parts with no critical engagement and little experiential learning. And that's echoed by Richard Sennett, <coughs> who calls it static repairing. But he opposes that to dynamic repairing, which potentially alters function or upgrades and possibly mixes tools and um, or techniques. And in this sense, I think repair can be imitative or bespoke and um, um, adaptive. So that can be referred to as ad hoc repairing um, by Glenn Adamson. But for me, I see repair as an attentive act that can occur before or after a break, which aims to make something work in the way that is needed. It's part of most making practices and also a craft of its own. For me, it exists in the now, in the past and the future, both negatively and positively. And um, we can use repair to develop an ongoing relationship with that which we have already made and own. Um, it's enacted at home, but also a professional practice. It can be solo or collaborative, beautiful or botched, high-end or lo-fi, celebrated or shameful. But it crosses boundaries and class and economics and countries and um, cultures and geographies and so on. Um, my practice-based PhD focused on understanding the narratives around what we mend or not, um, the subjectiveness of brokenness, object ownership and, and repair as a kind of whole uh, craft. Um, so where brokenness may be sometimes seen as end, I think repairing and making are strong statements of empowerment through choice by ability. So re to reclaim repair is to make our own choices around durability, um, to engage with social and aesthetic arguments, um, to actually own our own things and legally tinker with them, to regain hand skills, um, to retrain ourselves as consumers and slow our production and consumption habits and our disposal habits, and maybe to rethink waste as a material and to understand ourselves as now merged with our waste. So to repair then is maybe to act um, directly with hope for a future which is as yet unknown, but might be brighter, at least brighter than we're looking at right now. So just to go to something a little bit 
different. Um, I'm going to read a short passage from uh, sci-fi writer uh, Philip K. Dick's um, 1950s book, The Variable Man. This man is different. He can fix anything. He doesn't work with knowledge, with science, a classified accumulation of facts. He knows nothing. It's not in his head a form of learning. He works by intuition. His power is in his hands, not his head. Jack of all trades, his hands, like a painter, an artist, in his hands, and he cuts across our lives like a knife blade. The character of the variable man is accidentally brought forward to a time when knowledge is compartmentalized and people are highly, highly specialized. And he crosses these boundaries by working with his hands and knowing about processes and techniques rather than specific disciplines. He's parted from what he calls his uh, fix-it cart, which is where all his tools are, but he lands in a lab and sets about using their tools to solve a problem adjacent to the one suggested to him. So crucially, he's kind of interested in only one thing, and that's turning out the best job he could with the skill he possessed. So repair, we might say now, um, to go out of the sci-fi world, is an expanded and expansive practice, an enriching craft. And some of today's variable people are capable and skilled in the arts of repair. They repair together with others and alone, and they're brave enough to face problems and confident enough to seek support too. Um, but some of today's variable people are also working in slightly different ways, encouraging consciousness about consumption and campaigning to change manufacturing practices and so on. They remake objects, yeah? But they also make videos, maybe podcasts, text materials, legal requirements, and so on, which become the knife blade of like personal and object and action based resilience in the face of this scarcity. Um, and then above all, I think today's variable person is dynamic and visible and warm. They use the skills they possess to turn out the best job that they can, be that a material repair or a connection with repair workers, a social injustice, a political wrong, and so on. And I see these attributes in the communities in the repair scene and through my work uh, co-organising repair events with Hackney Fixers across um, the borough of Hackney, where we uh, encourage skill sharing, skill learning, as well as lots of lending. Um, as Marina mentioned, I was maker in residence at the V&A for about nine months. And there I looked at the, this was my studio there, um, there I looked at the relationship between repair and the museum. So um, repair appears in the museum in objects like prints like this, uh, showing people mending things um, as repaired objects acquired by the museum. Um, and as conservation practice. And this relationship is still really interesting to me because it's given me a new way to examine the ideas around visibility and repair making. So there's a sort of um, false dichotomy in the, um, that's a conservation um, picture from the conservation studios. Um, there's a sort of false dichotomy in the repair discourse between visible and invisible. And I've been trying to unpick that for a while. But loosely speaking, the visibility of repair making can be key to using it as politic, to create community and to highlight it as a craft, but it doesn't necessarily address questions around privilege and want um, or the implication of poverty or scruffiness um, and those sorts of things. So we potentially need more visible repair makers such as this guy who was a traveling clown who also recaned chairs, but maybe also less visible repair um, repairs or skills to make less visible repairs. So, but that invisibility often needs highly specialist skills or for objects to be designed to be repairable. But the current conservation practices appear to navigate this by practicing this semi-visible aesthetic, which is explained by this six inch, six foot rule. Um, that is a widely held rule is that the retouched areas should be unobtrusive when viewed from the sort of distance that is usual when an object is on display in a showcase, but easily discernible on closer inspection. This is referred to as the six inch, six foot rule. And uh, this cut glass um, copy of a rock crystal ewer in the VNA is a really good example of this for me. You can see it's been conserved, um, but although it's really uh, very broken, you can still understand the whole vessel. And that idea of considered visibility seems to me to fill the middle of what I see as a scale of visibility and repair making. So um, it was partly that that I tried to explore during my residency. Um, oops, sorry, responding to ideas um, 
present in the museum. And most of that came through research and conversation with the conservators and curators um, there. So one of the conservators showed me this carpet in the medieval galleries. And you can see on the bottom right and the top left, there are um, patches in it. And so when it arrived in the museum, those patches were actually made from painted plaster and they were causing the carpet to degrade and the patches themselves were crumbling away. So the decision was made to replace them with um, printed uh, inserts, right? But these um, prints, they're digital prints, um, and they were deliberately printed on a flat canvas, not tufted, and they're tonally a couple of shades lighter. So um, I um, had a go with that kind of technique, and I replaced some stained areas in this jumper with digitally printed patches, but rather than affecting the tone, I uh, went to play with the scale. So you can see that the pattern is slightly different in the patches, I would say by the neckline, it's probably the most clearest. Um, so they're visible, but they're maybe not so visible when standing back as per that carpet that I mentioned. Um, on a similar, but um, same, same, but different kind of note, um, this is green jumper. And I've been mending that with a, with a color, the color matched yarn, but um, there's an interesting tension in it because that's a woven darn um, in a knitted jumper. So it's stretchy versus not, and also it's a pure wool jumper, but it's not a pure wool yarn. So there's a material tension in there as well. So I'm quite interested in those tensions. Um, so this tapestry is also on display in the medieval galleries at the museum, but this shows old repairs and also newer conservation work. So the original repairs are the painted in backing cloths, which you can see on the left hand image, that kind of blue behind the knee and the severed hand. Um, and then the conservation work, which takes a bit of a different approach. You can see a, a, a sort of beige line going down the middle of the middle image. Um, and behind the plant there, and um, the sort of blobs of it. So you used a tonally um, appropriate coloured um, fabric, but they didn't try and paint it in and try and disguise it. And you can see uh, the original repairs and the conservation work next to each other in the right hand image on the, on the right hand side of it. Um, So I've been, I've been kind of playing with this technique a little bit. And one thing that I've been doing is working on this uh, tapestry just to see if I can create something as sort of integrated as um, the conservation work on that bigger tapestry and thinking about how we might be able to put that technique into practice further outside the museum. And the thing that also interests me about this is it discusses, these objects kind of discuss the mixture of contemporary and traditional or old techniques alongside new technologies and ideas, but they're all used to extend the life of objects. And then on a bit of a different note, again, um, <clears throat> repair is sometimes joked about, such as in the Trigger's broom skit from TV show Only Fools and Horses, and this plays on the myth of the ship of Theseus. So Trigger, the man on the right, he uh, wins an award for keeping his broom for a long time, during it, which it has had 17 new heads and 14 new handles. And this raises the question about how it's, uh, how is it the same broom then? And the Cerebly websites such as there I fixed it, show pictures of uh, inventive or on the hoof or kind of clutched repairs, which although meant as comedy, they also often show highly inventive and really interesting approaches. Um, but on the other end of a similarly ad hoc scale, this bowl is described as a beautifully crafted example of postmodern DIY. So it was made in 1987, broken, and then in 2002, I think, it was patched um, um, with a piece of fabric encased in fiberglass. And I, when I was thinking about these kind of unexpected approaches, I was looking at a pair of my sneakers and I decided to cast a new sole onto this one. It's kind of successful, but the material uh, I use shrunk um, quite a lot. And I don't know if it would be that grippy um, in wet weather, for example. Um, and I'm still working on kind of cobbling ideas for shoes that can't be mended. I've got a few other different ones that I've done. Um, but the anthropologist, uh, Richard Sennett, just to go back to him again, he comments that uh, makers um, stamps uh, evince a second category of material consciousness. So a laborer's statement, right? Saying I made this, I'm here in this work, which is to say I exist. And for me, that shoe sole is a highly visible attempt at a repair, but also potentially my signature, right? A sign of my existence. Um, 
particularly, I mean, this is my issue, but a lot of my work walks away from me, um, if you excuse the pun, as I work into other people's objects. So it's quite nice to have a sort of, I guess, like a signature walking around um, of your own work. Um, so breakdown can like offer space for innovation, right? That's probably pretty clear to everyone. But um, the philosopher Elizabeth Spellman kind of comments on the complicated attitude of repair. And, and that's something else that really interests me. So the yeah, uh, complexity such as like communicating values and functioning as both old and new, end and beginning, professional and amateur, um, they're all of interest to me. And part of what I'm trying to understand is what happens to the values of a craft when it's appropriated and really different uh, materials and skills are used. And then what happens to the value of the object, right? Does that appropriated craft still add emotional or financial or craft-based values to it? So I was looking at enamel repair and I came across this low temperature enamel, they call it, but it's a plastic that melts at 150 degrees. And I sourced this a uh, damaged cloisonne vessel from eBay. And I've done five coats of um, the low temperature enamel on it. So craft is often seen as authentic and as um, maybe that idea can help us deal with the unfamiliarity of breakage, right? And to adjust to that change. But, um, and as I mentioned, like resilience uh, is really important when you're working with repair. But then what happens to the resilience of a craft when we're using really inauthentic materials, even if to preserve a, a historic or other object? And you can see that again in the recent spread of appreciation of Kintsugi, um, a deliberately visible ceramic repair using Urushi lacquer and gold powder. And I think that that appreciation kind of uh, demonstrates a growing broader acceptance of that visibility and also of appropriation of crafts. Um, and maybe as we get more used to it as an aesthetic, it becomes less jarring than a broken object and less visible as a repair. But then new repair materials are also being developed like Sugru, and they are starting to be copied. And that adds another layer of complexity to the repaired objects. Uh, itself, I think. So, for example, this plate is fixed with Kintsu glue, which is a Sugru copy. And although I fixed it, like, can I actually claim authorship to it? Because I worked into an object made by someone else and I used a copy of a new material for that repair making. So, does that affect the authenticity of my practice? Maybe that doesn't matter, but you know, it's kind of an interesting conundrum to roll around. Um, on a completely different note, um, airbrushing was a really common practice for covering joins in ceramics, some more successful than others. And for me, as this as a technique, this kind of goes closer to restoration and maybe reflects the aims of the work. But my interpretation of it doesn't try to hide itself, but I'm asking why we might want to disguise the floor. Like, why are we trying to disguise our clumsiness in causing that damage? So just a last note on my v &A residency, I feel that representations of repair and repaired objects and conservation practices in the museum give us a, a kind of body of material practice and theory to learn from and also offer an approach between visible and invisible. And um, now I'm working on um, more repair techniques and deepening my understanding of how they can translate into our objects. I'm about to start a residency in an archive uh, near here. And I've also been working with the collection at the Museum of the Home, which is where these images are from, and um, doing some more object-based research and um, developing some ideas from that. Um, so just to sum up, really, um, through my overall practice, I attempt to examine uh, society and materiality and making, and I use those underlying concepts and processes and the materials that we use and the objects that we produce to discuss those unseen purposes of craft and making and the unseen, um, I guess, the, the, um, the questions around them as a way with which we can kind of deepen our relationship with our skills and our possessions and um, sustainable practices. And through that deep engagement and through that unpicking um, of those concepts, I'm really trying to demonstrate not only a care for our existing objects and practices, but also an attitude rooted really firmly in our future. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. That was absolutely wonderful. What a wonderful presentation. And thank you for uh, taking us to um, uh, visit all these um, 
the wonderful wor world of, of repairing and thinking about extending that to our communities of practice, but our communities of living as well, and yeah. our relationships yeah. with the objects that we uh, we have, the objects around you, the objects we bring to the world, uh, the longevity of the objects, and actually the visibility of the repairing, which is, uh, I think, very much linked with hope. Uh, yeah. So if, uh, yes, if hope is visible, um, <laughs> so it so has to be the, the fixing, <laughs> the repairing. Yeah. And maybe also um, thinking of uh, that not everything needs to be fixed, not uh, uh, that things sometimes needs to be uh, need to be t just taken on board as they are uh, and uh, <clears throat> yes so um, if you stay with us uh, um, Bridget we are going to move on to our next uh, presenter and then we are going to have a, a discussion of all the panelists in the yes. morning uh, later on about quarter past 12 yes Perfect. thank you so much yeah. thank you